Thou, O Lord, for Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. We say, I exalt Thee. I exalt thee, and I exalt thee, and I exalt thee, oh Lord. And I Lift our voices, we sing, we exalt thee. And we 
we exalt. And we exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. Take joy. I want to welcome you to our Saturday morning men's Bible study. And um, I've become aware that not everybody who's watching is a man, but that's okay. So when I say guys, I'm wanting to be inclusive. It's guys and gals, it's people, okay? But we want to welcome you. And we're going through the book of Philippians. Today we're going to pick up where we left off in chapter 2. So um, what I'd love to do is just read the passage to you and then we'll pray and then I'm going to unpack it to you. And I'm really excited about what we're going to take a look at today. I think, I mean, it really spoke to my heart and I trust that it will speak to you as well. So Philippians chapter 2, we're going to pick it up in verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. 
among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that your word has been preserved and maintained. And uh, God, when we take it up and read it, we can sense you as the voice behind these printed words on a page. We can sense you speaking into our lives. And so that would again be our prayer, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that you would speak and write upon the tablet of our hearts. And Father, please equip your saints to do the work of ministry that Jesus would be exalted. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, you may recall that as we're going through and looking at this chapter of Philippians, there is a main theme that's coming forward. And it's the idea of unity, of humility, and ministry. And the first part uh, really focused on unity. And then a beautiful passage that we looked at last time about the humility that Jesus demonstrated and, and the example that we're supposed to follow in his steps. Well, it's at this point that the emphasis comes more onto ministry. And the, in fact, the title that I have for our talk today is Shining Like Stars. And that's really what God has called you and me to be in the midst of uh, a dark times, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, uh, in really in the very specific thing that we're dealing with right now in this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic that God has called his church to shine like stars in a very dark and a very difficult time. And so there's a whole lot of things that we're going to unpack that really come into this. The first thing is an admonition from the Apostle Paul to be consistent. And consistency is a huge thing. Let me just read the line to you again. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And of course, Paul's writing from prison. He was, in a sense, um, under house arrest. And as Pastor John has pointed out to us, it's like being quarantined. He did not have the freedom to go out and about. But even though he was in chains and his place was limited to this house where he was confined, his influence was not limited. His prayers were not limited. And he, in fact, took up pen and... Um, Part and parchment to write this letter to the church in Philippi. And what he's saying to them is so important for you and for me to take to heart as well. Be consistent. Look, the circumstances of our life right now are not what we're accustomed to. It's not what we like. Our freedoms have been severely limited. And it's much, much more than being inconvenienced. Uh, we're really being confined for our good and for the good of other people. But Paul speaks something out here that I think is really important to take to heart. He says, be consistent. Don't just obey, Paul's saying, because I'm there with you, Philippians. Obey even though I'm not there with you. And that's a really important statement. In fact, while Paul was in prison, he wrote a similar thought to the Colossians. Let me just read it to you and remind you of this. He wrote in Colossians chapter 3 to the people who were slaves. And what he said to them is, in all things, obey those who are your masters here on earth, not with external service or eye service, as it says, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. So whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. You know, and there's always that temptation to be on when you know the boss is nearby. You know, you, you, you know that they're around and, and so everybody sits up a little bit straighter or polishes a little bit harder or speaks a little bit louder or just a little bit more attentive to detail. And what Paul is basically saying here is, you know what, even though I may not be there with you to keep an eye on you, Philippians, I need you to be just as obedient, just as responsible, just as mindful of the ministry that you have and the influence that you have for Christ, your witness, as it were. Even though I'm not there with you physically, I'm with you there in spirit. And that's important for us to remember during these times of where we're, in a sense, quarantined 
under house arrest. Okay, so some of those authority figures may not be there. Look, you may be working from home, but you need to be mindful of the fact that you are gainfully employed and that your boss, they may not be there physically, but you want to work as hard and as diligently as though they were there in the room with you. And likewise, spiritually, we're working as unto the Lord. And so, you know, like our, our pastors and whatnot, they may not be physically with us right now, but they're with us in spirit. And the things that they've taught us, the things that they've modeled before us, the things that they've challenged us with, those are the same expectations that are still very much in place. And so this is a great um, message to you and to me. Regardless of the circumstances is to be consistent, to be diligent. Be consistent with your quiet time. Be consistent with your schedule, especially if you're working from home. Be consistent with things like good nutrition and getting some exercise and um, going to bed at a reasonable time and waking up when you normally would. Be consistent. Um, be consistent in your prayer life. Be consistent in your witness. And be consistent just in knowing that you're representing the King of Kings, whether it's just around your family and those that are in your home or the people who are aware of your presence online or how you are working from home. So that's the first and foremost thing. But then there's a very, very powerful statement and familiar to all of us. Work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. You know, some people get kind of scared when they read that. Go, Oh my gosh, you mean I have to work to earn my salvation? Well, no, not at all. He's not saying work to get saved. He's saying you are saved and you need to let what's that saved part of you work its way out. When we were convicted of our sinful status before a holy God, when we confessed our sins and our need for a savior, Jesus cleansed us and we are in Christ. He set his spirit in our hearts and we are saved. We're saved right now from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. And when this our time on earth is over and we are ushered into his presence. We are going to be saved from the presence of sin. So right now, there's a process that we're called to participate in. The name of that process is sanctification. And that's what working out your salvation is. It's what's in our heart, in our spirit, working its way to affect what we think the things that we value, the decisions that we make, but also what we do with our very bodies. We are working out that saved condition. We are to have our minds be renewed. We know that from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. But then I want to point you to a couple other verses that Paul wrote to the churches in Thessalonica and also something that Peter wrote in his first letter. So if you want to turn with me in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to take a look at this together. 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul uses this term sanctification three times in this one chapter. He says in 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 4, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us instruction as how you ought to walk and please God, that you excel still more. Verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And then here we hit the jackpot in verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he breaks it down and explains what he means by that. That is... That, number one, you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his body in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who don't know God. And then he goes down in verse 7 to say, For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. And so very clearly, this is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. One other place to look at, uh, it, writing to the Thessalonians, in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Th Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And this summarizes it beautifully. He says, We should always give thanks to God for you, 
brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you for, from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. So here's what happens. When we unite our faith in the truth, God begins a sanctifying work by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies us. We can't really sanctify ourselves. We can't purify or cleanse or make ourselves holy. But the Spirit of God, when we yield and submit to his power and influence and control, that's exactly the work that he accomplishes. One more place is 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and it is verse 2. Paul talks about the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ that we as believers have been sprinkled by his blood. A powerful statement about the Trinity right there, the foreknowledge of God the Father, the, sanct the cleansing blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, but the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So let's go back to our text here in Philippians chapter 2. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. God the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within you and me. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, is what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. So with that in mind, what God has started in us is to be expanded ever-increasing influence and control and, it's, in a sense, dominance by the Holy Spirit. Don't yield your members, the members of your body, to sin that you would obey that, but instead yield to the Holy Spirit that you might please and be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So this is a lifelong process that's called sanctification. It's with our minds being renewed, our choices our values being conformed to the will of God, which is really revealed in the word of God. And then on top of that, it's our conscious choice to yield the members of our body to the control and the dominance and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And I love this phrase, and I know you do too, for it is God who's at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen. God's at work in your life. God is the one who prompts you and gives you ideas. God is the one who puts a burden on your heart. Pray for this person. Reach out to this person. Text or call or um, visit, you know, read this book. And then you read this book and you find something that's just a gem and you're reminded of somebody else and you're so excited you want to share it with them. And so you reach out to them. It's God who's at work within you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God has not asked us to do something that's beyond our ability to achieve. It's his ability to achieve in us and through us. God is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know, a lot of times when I read this verse, I can't help but think about over and over and over again, different people, men and women, members of the body of Christ, that God showed them something. He gave them a vision. He gave them a burden. He put something on their heart. And then uh, what I found to be true is that when God gives you the vision, he gives you the mission. Um, it's not like God's needing to give us an idea so that we can pass it on to other people. But God wants to fill all of us with vision so that we can find our mission field. A lot of you guys know Alan from church, Alan Ludwin. And a couple of years ago, Alan was reading through this devotional book and he shared with me and it was really convicting him, really challenging him that he was supposed to step up and that God wanted to use him in some way uh, in ministry. He really was wondering what it was because he, he was involved, you know, as an usher and he was involved in home fellowships at those times. He, and he was a, a part of the men's ministry. But he was uh, seeking God and praying, God, what do you have? What is it you're speaking to me about? And at that time, uh, all of us who live in Moreno Valley got a little postcard from the city of Moreno Valley, the parks and recreation, and it was a, a simple listing of all the different uh, publicly owned parks in the city. Now, 
I did with my postcard what you may have done with yours. I looked it over and thought, wow, there's a lot of them. And then I threw in the trash. But guess what Alan did? He said, Lord, could you be speaking to me through this postcard? And he prayed about it. And God said to him, yes, I am speaking to you. I want you to go every week to a different city park and pray. Pray for the people that live in the neighborhood surrounding that park. And so Alan told us that he went and he shared this idea, the vision with Pastor John. Pastor John thought it was a great idea. I mean, who doesn't want people praying? Who doesn't want people praying for the people in the city? So he did. And so Alan went by himself and he drove up to this park and sat in his car and prayed for the people in the area around and then came back and reported to guys that he knew and men in the men's ministry. And then the next week, one of the guys said, hey, can I go with you this time? And Alan said, of course, because if you have twice as many people praying, that's awesome. So they drive up to the park and um, Pete, and those of you who know Pete, uh, was with him. And Pete turns to him and says, well, now we're going to get out of the car, right? And Alan thought to himself, I never thought about that before. That's a great idea. So they get out and then they pray. And the prayer was, Lord, whoever's here at this park today, may you prepare their heart for us in the conversation when we go to them. And so they, that began this prayer in the park ministry. And they would go up to people, introduce themselves, ask them a simple question. How can we pray for you today? And you know, there have been people who came to faith in Christ. There was an ROTC unit that was practicing the park on a Saturday morning. And they listened to the gospel and several of them indicated an interest to receive Christ. And then more people came and bringing their ideas, their vision. Hey, we could gather warm clothing or we could have a meal. We could do a barbecue or one thing led to another. And more and more people being involved. More vision equal more mission, more impact. So what does that say? It really shows through the men and women, the people in Calvary Chapel, Moreno Valley, working out their own salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work in them, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Amen. Now, the next part might kind of surprise you in verse 14. And maybe if you read this at a different time, a different stage in your life, you would have thought, huh, that's kind of weird and just pass over it. But uh, in the situation we're in right now, uh, in close quarters with our family members, it kind of makes a little bit more sense. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You know, when we all would get in our cars and drive to our places of employment and spend our days there and then maybe drive home or drive to the gym before we'd go home, we spent really a little, just a little bit of our awake hours at home. Well, things have changed quite a bit uh, with the, self, the isolation and the safer at home and only uh, traveling when absolutely necessary. We're spending a lot more time with family members. All the schools are closed, public and private. So kids are being homeschooled. Parents are trying to work from home. And we are rubbing shoulders a lot more than we are used to. And believe me, when we rub shoulders like that and we're in close quarters all day long, all week long, uh, we rub off on a little bit on each other. In fact, we can actually bug each other. And um, this verse puts us to the test. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So what's Paul saying here? Well, the Bible is telling us that um, because God's at work within us and we're called to ministry and we're called to let our light shine, we're going to be tempted to uh, be bothered by each other, by each other's flesh, each other's sinful nature, each other's maybe immaturity, and maybe somebody else's zeal, whatever it is, that person just bugs me. And, um, you know, he says, do it without grumbling or disputing. I, I ran across a very interesting quote this week. I was reading a book by C.S. Lewis. It's called The Great Divorce. In fact, I'll do a little show and tell with you right now. Um, I picked this up 
uh, and I, it's a great story. It talks about what happens to people after they die. And um, it talks about heaven, and it talks about hell. Well, one of the lines in it that was very interesting was a question was asked about somebody else who, someone else who had died. Are they a grumbler or are they a grumble? And I thought, well, that's kind of a funny idea. But as it was explained, it came down to this. People grumble and become grumblers. But somebody who just grumbles all the time and in a sense, give themselves over to that complaining negativity, that grumbling, they actually become, according to C.S. Lewis at least, a grumble. They become that thing that they give themselves over to repeatedly over and over and over again. Think about it. Somebody can be a complainer, but then they become a complaint. Somebody can be... Um, critical but then they become a criticism and other sins besides those when you give yourself over repetitively to a particular sin that thing can dominate you and needless to say it can almost negate your witness and your testimony we're called to shine like stars but it can be something that's abrasive and gritty and just obscures the vision that's supposed to come from that star. And so he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. All things, all things. All things like emptying the garbage, yeah, like that. Like doing the dishes that are piling up in the sink, yes, like that. Like putting the dishes in the dishwasher back in the cabinet, yes, like that. Like all kinds of stuff that happens in the interaction of living life together. And the beautiful thing, though, is that when we adopt that position of a non-grumbling, non-complaining uh, mentality, we are making a statement. We're proving something. We are proving by our not grumbling that we are, in a sense, truly blameless and innocent children of God. That we really belong to Him. And it's not with an air of moral superiority. It's actually a different kind of morality. It's a humble morality. It's living a life in Christ. It's living as a light to the world. It's living broken and dependent and absolutely asking God to take over complete control. And so the result is uh, to be above reproach as it says in one translation, as it says here, blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach. What does it mean to be above reproach? When somebody else looks at you negatively, critically, wanting to accuse you of something, their accusation doesn't stick. It's like Teflon. It just slides right off. Why? Because it's baseless. It's groundless. It doesn't connect with reality because the life that you're living is anchored and rooted in Christ. And so, I mean, look, there's the, the contrast, of course, two household things, Teflon, Velcro. Now, I did a little bit of research on Velcro because I remembered when um, our kids were younger and somebody came out with a Velcro instead of shoelaces for little kid shoes. And I thought, that person is a genius. Well, I found out that um, the inventor of Velcro was a, a Swiss man, an engineer, who had been hiking up in the Alps with his dog one day. And as he got back home, he realized that his clothing and his dog's uh, fur were matted with these cockle burrs. And being an engineer and being inquisitive, as he's removing them from his articles of clothing and from his dog, he was wondering, what made those things stick? And it was because the um, garment, fabric, and even dog's hair has little loops, as he looked at it, under a very high-powered microscope. But the cockle burrs have hooks on them. And so just walking through, the hooks from those weeds have their seed pods attached to the loops in the, in the fabric and even 
the dog's hair. And so he worked on it and he came up with a design whereby you could have a synthetic material, the same type of material, actually one was looped and the other one, if you break the loop, it's a hook and that's what Velcro is all about. And you've noticed, if you've been around Velcro long enough, it doesn't just stick to itself, but it seems like anything else, hair, uh, fur, any, anything sticks to it. And so in a way, that's the negative example where every accusation sticks, everything adheres. Why? Because that person's life is unguarded and in a sense, not sanctified, not controlled or dominated by the Holy Spirit. So it's this choice, Velcro or Teflon. And what the scripture is telling us is to be above reproach, blameless and innocent. All the accusations don't stick. No one can criticize you because you are living that life that's freed from grumbling and complaining. Some good advice to us who are living in quarantine. Okay, and then that brings us to this really beautiful and powerful and kind of magnificent statement. He says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, you are shining like lights in the world. You're shining like stars is literally what it reads in the Greek text. And you know what, Christian? That is an awesome description of the privilege that it is to be a witness for Jesus Christ to this generation in which we live, to shine like stars. And again, it's not a moral superiority where we look at people condemning them, condemning them for their clothing, condemning them for their lifestyle, that they make bad choices, you know, um, that, they're, that they're inconsistent, that they're grumbling, maybe they're a grumble, who knows, but not to be looking down at them in a judgmental way, but really with a heart of compassion. Because at one time, we were stumbling around in the darkness. At one time, we were dominated by the lusts of our flesh. At one time, every influence that came to us from the enemy, we adhered to it. We followed it. We never resisted it. We gave in. We gave in. We caved into it without giving it really a second thought. But now that we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we've been purchased, we've been forgiven by that blood, we've learned that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Our bodies, as I said earlier, are temples of the Holy Spirit. We no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to him. And so consequently, we now reflect Jesus to the world around us. That's our ministry. Our ministry to him is to worship him, to love him, to know him. But our ministry to the world is to make him known. And that's both by word and by action. Acts of compassion, of, of uh, service, but also living that life in Christ that accurately represents him. Shining like stars. Now, you remember when we used to be able to go to the mall or be able to go shopping and you see in the mall the jewelry store. And you remember how they had the beautiful gemstones displayed. They'd always be against a backdrop of a dark color like a black velvet or something like that. And so that the gemstones and the setting, and of course there's light that's coming down on it, capturing all the different facets of the stone as it's been cut and how beautifully it had been set and it, it just by the contrast. And you know something? Your life and my life were to shine like stars. And the idea is this, that in contrast to the darkness of the world, the hopelessness of the world around us, the fear, Jesus even said in the last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear. And there are people who are so afraid right now. But you and I have the privilege to shine with the light of Jesus, to shine with his love, to shine with his truth, to shine with his presence and his power, and to give to people hope in really a hopeless situation. So we are called 
to shine like stars, to appear as lights in the world. And then this last little phrase, it says, holding fast the word of life. Hold on to it for all you've got. Don't lessen your grip on it. Hold on to it. But it doesn't just mean to hold on to it. It also means to extend it, to hold it out to others. This is the lifeline. This is what made a difference in my life. And it will make a difference to you as well. The word of life, the message of the gospel, the life of Jesus, the light that's in him, the love that's in him, the truth that's in him, the hope that's in him, not just for this world or this realm, this sphere of activity, but for all eternity. So we are holding on to it, but we are also holding it out to others, extending it to them as the means for God to radically change their lives. And so this message Paul presents here, this really is, again, in the context of unity, of humility, and of ministry. The greatest ministry, knowing him. But right after that is making him known. Making him known today. Making him known to the people that you live around. Making him known to people that you may not get to see directly, but you can reach out to them and care for them, and love on them. And so my hope and my prayer for all of us is that we would take this to heart in all these different places, these points that are here, to be consistent, to be sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it's God, the Holy Spirit, who's at work within us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. <clears throat> To not be grumblers, but instead to be those people who are above reproach that we might shine like stars, holding forth this awesome word of life, this message of real life, true life in Jesus Christ. So I want to leave that with you. Next week, as we continue our study in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to look at two people that Paul singles out as exemplary examples to follow. These are people who were doing the work of ministry that he personally commended to that church that he was writing to in Philippi. They knew these men and they knew the quality of their lives. And so Paul could speak to that and he could point to them as these positive examples that could be seen and followed. So until then, I want to encourage you to just keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus, keep following after him. And as we read here today, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it's God who's at work within you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let's pray. So Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank you that you can write it on our hearts. And we want to be quick, God, to confess anything that would be inconsistent Anything that would be uh, where we're working in our own strength or our own energy. Anything, God, where we've fallen into grumbling and complaining. Or anything, God, where we are obscuring the light that you want to shine through our lives. As you bring those things to our minds, even now, that we'd be quick to confess them in order that we would be cleansed from them. And our great desire is to live lives yielded to the power of your spirit and, Lord, to be pleasing in your sight. So we commit ourselves afresh to you unto this purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we look forward to being again with you next week.